Today's uh, topic is on multidisciplinary approaches to research. Disciplines get uh, divided on numerous lines. There are as many disciplines as there are possibilities. Disciplines also get uh, divided on the basis of approaches. There are as many approaches as there are possibilities. Any context can be studied through several approaches. If one of you is going to study the communication behavior of second year students of Department of Journalism and Communication, University of Madras, you can take an historical approach. And if that is going to be an historical approach, uh, then you need to look at variations in the patterns of communication behavior over the years. Now, I know this department since 1980. And I am seeing, broadly put, uh, certain paternal changes in the behavior and attitude of communication students since 1980. So if I am going to work on this topic, communication behavior of uh, journalism department students of University of Madras since 1980, and if I am going to take an historical approach, then I look at decadal differences in patterns. What were the dominant attitudes, dominant belief systems, value systems of teachers and students in the department during 1980? And you might ask, sir, how can you do a, s a study like that? Where are the students now? Isn't it? Then I might get in touch with the office of the department or the university or the alumni association, try to get the addresses of a sample of students who can represent that decade. Now you are likely to have nearly 10 batches between 1980 and 1990. And if I am going to find certain core values that can be ascribed to this 1980s batch, and if these core values are going to be different from the students who studied during 90s, students who studied during 2000s, then I see three broad patterns. And I would also be looking at the reasons why there were differences in attitudes. So one reason could be the size of the class. The second reason could be composition of the class. These are internal variables. Third reason could be the size of the faculty. Fourth reason could be composition of the faculty. So there could be any number of reasons internal to the department, internal to the university. Then there could also be external reasons, external factors, societal factors, such as uh, transport for instance. So I might get into interesting uh, data collection such as how many students commuted long distance and how many bus routes operated to Anna Square during 1980, covering different parts of the city and what happened to some of the bus routes during the 90s, how they were replaced 
for what and how many bus routes survive now so something uh, as uh, ordinary as the change of bus route or absence of a bus route now or the presence of a new route can have an implication for a certain kind of attitude behavior on the part of students the classroom behavior i mean so these are the external factors societal factors or economic factors political factors external to the environment of the department so this is just to indicate what you can do with just one approach historical approach if i am going to do the same study with something like an anthropological approach anthropology looks at uh, behavior of human groups given populations in any one context and tries to figure out why this group behaves in a particular manner what are the characteristics of this group so anthropologically speaking communication behavior might take a different route than the historical approach in that case uh, i might go in for anthropological methods such as ethnography participant observation visual anthropological methods etc etc again here i would draw sample of students who can represent 80s 90s and 2000s but if i am going to use an anthropological method such as uh, the visual anthropological method i may not be interested in meeting the students at all the researcher who is wedded to visual anthropology would uh, go in for visual materials that could get him some idea about how the students were seated during 80s how different the seating position was during 90s how different the seating position was so i may be interested only in collecting the pictures and photographs of students in the classroom setting i need not meet the students at all if you are going to uh, employ visual anthropology something like uh, five or 10 still photographs would do for such a research or something like a few minutes or few hours of video footage would do here the researcher is going to access the sample the human group through how they are depicted visually in the form of a still image or in the form of a group photo now think about this possibility most of us would have had group photos when we studied in school isn't it how many of you have uh, these group photos at work nalla kai thookungala edhukku yeah most of the majority here okay uh, can access can access through memories through nostalgic memories about our classmates about our teachers about the wonderful school days isn't it now if these photographs are going to be accessed by a visual anthropology researcher then it opens up new windows of opportunity for such a researcher how
if a 30 year study period such as the one I suggested since 1980 until now something like 30 years is, 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 is going to be the study period you are going to have something like 30 group shots of different batches isn't it and these 30 group photographs can form the big backbone of a good research rooted in visual anthropology one the size of the class what were the parameters i mentioned the size of the class gender composition of the class how many boys how many girls gender composition of the faculty how many male faculty members how many female faculty members gender composition of the office staff how many males how many females then age related parameter of the faculty as well as the office staff and then external ambience location of the group photo inside the department outside the department inside the building outside the building where likewise you can stretch the parameters list of parameters that could be investigated through the visual anthropology approach but one big challenge is privacy and ethical concern how to get uh, the private photos of 30 batches now if your department is going to have an archive in India that does not happen that does not happen we are not uh, uh, very careful about uh, archiving these things so it is very unlikely that your department is going to get you the 30 year group photos so you have to cultivate relationship with the alumni of the department and get access to 30 year group photos now there are privacy issues involved so these are group photos of students who passed out long time ago so ethically speaking visual anthropology researchers should get the concern of if not all the people in the group at least one of them assuring them that this photo will not be used for non-research purposes of course this is a group photo and uh, the group photo still contains images of individuals uh, who are not anonymous individuals whose details can be accessed by others so one of the important concerns uh, in uh, visual anthropology research as in any area of research is uh, trying to get the consent of the people who are related to the data if they agree yes otherwise as researchers we have no business to violate the privacy of individuals now there are other disciplinary approaches uh, new disciplinary approaches like uh, cultural studies for instance now in the historical approach uh, you are going to work on the decadal differences in the communication behavior of a given set of students in the case of visual anthropology you are going to work on the group photos of uh, 30 batches trying to figure out uh, how the parameters have been changing over the years 
for instance, uh, one important uh, parameter could be uh, the dress code, informal as well as uh, formal dress codes uh, that are in operation inside universities. Uh, you can make a brilliant study just focusing on color of the dress. If you are a good visual anthropology researcher, you need not look at any other parameter except looking at the way the color of the dress changes if you happen to have color photographs. If you don't have color photographs, if you have black and white photographs, you can still work on how the dress patterns of boys and girls have been changing over the years, trying to map the same. And uh, you can also look at the way teachers are dressing differently these days. How teachers dressed some 30 years ago, 40 years ago in the same department and how teachers are dressing these days. Uh, how the colors have changed from very sober to something like this, very dark. Uh, uh, these are not uh, individual choices. If you are going to look at the changes, these are not individual choices. These individual choices are greatly influenced by uh, given societal, cultural and other context. So the way we dress today, uh, we may think that uh, it is largely uh, uh, our own choice, but uh, it is not so. It is not so. The color of your dress is uh, not given by your choice. The choice is uh, remotely controlled by many other factors. Okay, There are market forces, there are cultural factors, there are societal conditions and there are external forces in the way we dress, the way we eat. Now, the third approach which I am going to introduce now is uh, keeping the same example is cultural studies. By far the most uh, interesting one, one which I work with. I may be biased, but uh, I have strong reasons why I work with cultural studies approach. One strong reason is uh, cultural studies look at uh, the same human beings but as uh, meaning making members of a given culture. So cultural studies uh, looks at how meanings are made in new forms by us. How new meanings are made possible by us all the time and how in the process of accessing new meanings we access new texts. And before cultural studies came into being, uh, text had only one meaning and that meaning was uh, supposedly given by the author. So something like uh, the, work of, the work of Shakespeare, for instance, the work of uh, Thruvalluvar, for instance, the work of Cumber, for instance, had a definitive authorship. Okay. So any play by Shakespeare has to be attributed to Shakespeare. Any verse written by a poet has to, be, has to be attributed to that poet. So there is a definite relationship between the creative work and the person who authored it. This was taken for granted for several centuries. So people could not dispute the fact that there were more than one meaning for a given work. So something like Thirukural was supposed to have only one meaning. 
something like Kambaramayanam was supposed to have only the meaning attributed by the author Kambar, that's it. One text, one meaning. For centuries, this was how texts and meanings were put in a binding relationship. Around 1950s, after the end of Second World War, in British universities, uh, many left-wing scholars, left-wing scholars meaning those scholars who thought that uh, the Marxist approach was ideal to look at the problems, challenges faced by human beings in Britain. So they started creating a new discipline through their works and towards 1970s this discipline came to be known as cultural studies. And uh, who are these scholars? They were predominantly scholars who were left-oriented, believed in socialism or communism or Marxism. Reasons, the post-war England was going through a lot of social problems. There was a very active left-wing labor movement. And when uh, an iron lady called Margaret Thatcher became the prime minister, this came to a climax. She started privatizing all the public sector units in UK. So there was wide scale unemployment, large scale closure of public uh, sector companies. The all marks of uh, British economy went out of the control of government. For instance, uh, British Airways was privatized, the coal industry was privatized, British Railways was privatized, everything was privatized. Everything belonged to the private sector and nothing belonged to the government sector. So this became uh, the focal point of the anti-Thatcher movement across the British society. And when uh, a prestigious university like Oxford wanted to confer doctorate on Thatcher. It was defeated by two-thirds majority vote. She was uh, not given the doctorate. So that was the sentiment of uh, academics, uh, professors, scholars, man on the street against Thatcher. So she must be seen as uh, the origin of the present wave of globalization. So even though globalization is uh, normally traced to the collapse of Soviet Union, uh, the person, one person who laid the foundation for the present wave of globalization was uh, Margaret Thatcher. So all these left-wing scholars were uh, interested in uh, focusing on social issues through a different prism and try to uh, figure out how people were making new meanings as part of conventional texts. Uh, so uh, what I mean by conventional texts are our newspapers, our books, our society, our street, the shops in our street, and uh, our television programs. These are the conventional texts. So our newspapers get us a meaning. Uh, the policeman at the traffic signal, he gets us a meaning, isn't it? Our teachers give us meanings. So uh, cultural studies uh, wanted to engage with uh, meanings provided by conventional texts as well as uh, new texts. When, what are the new texts? For the first time, cultural studies scholars uh, proposed a radical departure 
in dealing with text. And they said, anything that gets us a meaning has to be seen as a text. So a text need not be a printed stuff. A text need not be a newspaper. A text need not be a book. This wall can be read as a text. The light above can be read as a text. This PowerPoint presentation minus the content can be read as a text. The color of our dress can be read as a text. Text is anything and everything that, that gets us meanings, period. So there are as many texts in this uh, environment as there are possibilities. Isn't it? Can you count the number of texts in this uh, room, small room in this big building? Quick, Gaudaman. Now you understand the cultural studies approach to meaning making. Anything that gets you the possibility of a meaning can be considered as a text. Tamil la solana pradigal arthangal. Yellame pradigal da. Unga puttaga matram pradigal. Newspaper matram pradigal. Achadika patta tal matram pradigal. Arthate kudukum yella vishayangalum pradigal da. Na manindirukum madagal. Nam sayyum kariangal. Na munu munavu. In the array, in the array in color, in the array in nilagalam, in the taray in color, nam in the amarnirkum amip, the way we are seated, all these get us meanings. Texts are the sources of meanings, and we are the meaning making machines. All the time we seek meanings. All the time we seek meanings because we are surrounded by many texts, multiple texts. We are connected with multiple texts. And either yar pradana mana pradi, nam dan pradana mana pradi, nam dan pradi. I am the text. Every one of you can say proudly that I am the text. All of us give the other text meanings. So think of this possibility, not as human beings, but as text. All the second year students of uh, this department as text. That possibility exists. You would not have thought about this before. I introduced this approach, isn't it? That possibility certainly existed and that exists. That is opening up a new window of opportunity for researching how communication students of this department since 1980 existed as text. Now get back to the 30 year old photo archive. Get those 30 photos. Now. Do not follow the visual anthropology approach. Try to look at the 30 photos, group photos. Look at them as cultural texts. Texts getting you some meaning. Again, you can explore color. Again, you can explore air style. Again, you can explore the way students keep their pens, for instance. All of us take this for granted. The way students hold their notebooks or bags, that can communicate a lot about the person. Not just color of the dress, not just uh, the style of the dress, but the accessories on the dress. What accessories uh, uh, boys have in these photos and girls have in these photos? To begin with, uh, you can look at the way they hold something like a book or a bag. 
and many of these left wing scholars came from outside Britain. So they were post colonial subjects. They were coming from ex colonies of Britain. And one such person was uh, Stuart All. You saw Stuart All's uh, lecture on representation. So Stuart All was born in Caribbean island, Jamaica. So he migrates to Britain and then becomes a university faculty member. And uh, being a black, there was a possibility for a scholar like Stuart All to see himself as a text conditioned by the color black. And this text was working in a conflicting relationship in a predominantly white society, okay, wherein the cop was white, other faculty members were white, majority of the students were white. And here was a peculiar looking black who was not a black from Africa, but was a Caribbean black. And when these scholars were looking at uh, the social tensions in British society, for instance, how blacks were being treated by the white dominated police force, there emerges an important work by Stuart All and others policing the state. How police tries to label blacks in a racialized manner, not with any objectivity, how the British police, predominantly white dominated British police was trying to attribute all crimes to one section of the society that came from outside Britain and that was seen as the source of all threats. So in any Western society, even today, you would find uh, the mainstream newspapers, mainstream media putting the blame on one part of the society, one section of the society living in a particular geographical area. So you take any major Western city, you would have something like East Ham in London or Orlem in New York, these are seen as dangerous and many areas in Cape Town, Johannesburg for instance, they are seen as dangerous within courts. For 50, 70 years, films, books, newspapers, television programs, radio programs have portrayed these parts of otherwise a beautiful city as dangerous. Reason being, they are populated by the other racial group. These districts do not have whites in any number, in any significant number. So they must be dangerous. So policing the state by this cultural study scholar became a huge uh, talking point. So police as a text, what kind of a text? A racialized text. Now come, come to our context. How do you look at police on the street? We don't look at uh, the racial categories. We look at the cop with the white uniform as a very corrupt subject. This, this, this guy is not seen as dangerous, but he is seen as a very corrupt. So there, there, there are possibilities uh, for an honest cop in this crowd, but we mistake and we normally take for granted that there are no honest cops. All the guys in white uniform are corrupt. Color white can be researched in brilliant ways in the Indian context. Who wears color white? Who wears color white? Film actors, politicians, 
cops who else god men and also and also elderly folk or rural folk the farmer might also prefer color white so we are going to research the text that is color white in the indian context now if you are going to ask her avu peru enak epovume and the rendu pasanga exactly and the pony namana what happened to her the other girl went back to china va இவ சொன்னாலான்னு கேளு that is dangerous okay please tell her that uh, her name will be removed shortly if she is not reporting that visa will be cancelled Our visa will be cancelled. Okay. Please tell her and uh, get me the report by the end of this week. Please tell me by Friday the status. Is she really interested in coming back to the department? Or not, you please tell me by Friday. Okay. Yeah. Okay, coming back to... our country color red what is the significance of color red in chinese society why it is important why red is important yeah so color red is uh, the most important part of life in any chinese uh, human being so the moment a baby is born the baby is told in empty number of ways to believe in the logic of color red what is the logic of color red money 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 wealth 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 prosperity 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 so life is made meaningful only by the presence of color red So color red is the most predominant text in the life of any Chinese then and now all other texts they have to play a subordinate role all other colors are insignificant they are only subordinates so text may have universal material properties what are the material properties this is a material property this is a material property okay so color red as a material property it is different from color green or color white okay so it has a material character that material character conveys a meaning no doubt so universally we can recognize color red as different from color green but besides this material meaning it also has a cultural meaning isn't it so across the world everyone recognizes color red no doubt but they recognize color red differently so for a chinese color red signifies wealth for an indian it signifies fertility for a european it might signify something else 
so also for an Indian color white may signify purity for other cultures it might signify something else in different cultures so to deal with something like wealth money prosperity or healthy life there are innumerable cultural texts in circulation for instance for Latin Americans the native Indians in Latin America the most precious thing in life is corn Makka Cholana Valkain Unmayana Artham for East Asians and North Asians we don't value corn as an important uh, edible thing at all unless we go to a multiplex and uh, get a packet of corn we don't recognize corn isn't it corn is not part of our life rice is part of our culture ours is a rice based culture but the Latin American culture is rooted in corn so corn is the deity corn is sacred corn is life for a Chinese Japanese or Indian corn means nothing it doesn't even enjoy a subordinate status as a text so uh, texts are multiple numerous countless and the meanings are also multiple numerous countless so I have given you just one topic communication behavior of students of the Department of Journalism University of Matters and I have outlined three possibilities historical anthropological and cultural studies and the third one is throwing up lot of challenges and possibilities because here the author doesn't exist there is no Shakespeare there is no Cumber there is no Milton the author is one who gives a new meaning to the work of Shakespeare the reader who is seeing a new meaning in the Shakespeare's work the viewer who is watching a film made by somebody in the distant past and trying to seek a new meaning what meaning you got from yesterday's film Okay. Thank 
As I see it, uh, the class is divided. I'm not sure whether you observed it. Uh, the boys focused on meaning such as starting with Aro Kiraj, uh, class struggle, class struggle. And as we progress towards this side, we find girls focusing on more on gender inequalities, male chauvinism and other meanings. But uh, why C. N. Anadurai wrote a script like that? It was, in my opinion, to deal with uh, the source of what he saw as a problem. His party was uh, trying to challenge the supremacy of the Congress party and uh, he saw 
the problem lay with the, the rich who are mostly Congress uh, sympathizers. The Zamindas, Mirasdas, all of them were on other side of the fence. They were not DM DMK party members or sympathizers. So here was a party that was trying to make inroads politically and the target naturally had to be those who were on the other side of the fence. So DMK in the early days was trying to challenge Congress politically, socially, culturally. So these Zamindas had to be brought within the text as the source of all the problems. So the meaning probably the author had in mind, the predominant meaning he had in mind was this uh, devil-like uh, Congress uh, Zamindar who was uh, trying to cause lot of oppression in the lives of ordinary people. That was the focus of the author probably. But we as viewers of the film in a different age, now nearly 60 years have passed since the making of the film. And uh, we watch this film in our own context, in our contemporary context, which acts as the source of meaning for us to deal with the text on the screen, which is a old film made some 60 years ago. Then ourselves as a text. So in reading meanings of Ori Ravu, we are also conditioned by us, the dominant text. So text are put in a complex web of relationships. So if you are going to watch a film, the film is not the single text. You are the text, the co-viewers, they are the text, the film is the text, the characters inside the film are text too. So there is a very complex web of uh, relationships between and among tests and this also results in a complex web of meanings and relationships based on such meanings. Any film according to cultural studies approach should not be seen as a single text. It has multiple text. Yenda thirai padamum oru mulu pradiyaga parka padakudadu. And the predicula pala wood predigal irikindrana. And the wood predicula pala wood predigal irikindrana. Let me get you another example tower clock building. You can look at tower clock building as a text. This tower clock building, this beautiful structure, also has a number of subtexts. The subtexts also have a number of sub sub text let me get you another example the beautiful marina beach you can look at the beautiful long marina beach as an umbrella text but this umbrella text has to be divided in terms of the subtext now the anaskaya side of marina beach is a different text compared to the labor statue side of uh, Marina Beach compared to the Presidency College Kanagi side of Marina Beach compared to the Vivekananda House side of Marina Beach as you move towards Santom you get a different text altogether. So Marina Beach can also be studied as an umbrella text or master text. It can also be studied in terms of the subtext. So the tower clock building has lot of subtext. The department of communication could be one subtext. The rooms within the department of communication could be another subtext. The studio could be another subtext. The rooms within the studio could be another subtext. So any text is made possible by not the text, by the 
subtext. Or iravu as a film, as a text is made possible not by anything outside the or iravu as a text but by what is inside. What is inside the bottle? These are the subtexts. The characters, the story world, the ambience, the rooms, the always, the objects, so many things are inside a subtext and each of them constitute multiple subtext. Each of the subtext in turn constitute, constitute multiple subtext. There is no end to this list of text, subtext, subtext, subtext. There is no end to the list of meanings that are made possible by this in a very complex way and cultural studies approach looks at how we as human beings generate new meanings. We disregard completely Shakespeare's meaning. We disregard completely anadorized meaning. We generate our own text out of the film we watch. We generate our own meanings. So in cultural studies ap approach, the author is multiple. as many as there are viewers. The authors are as many as there are viewers of a film. So a Maniratnam film or a Shah Rukh Khan film or a Rajini film cannot be seen only as a Maniratnam film, Shah Rukh Khan film or Rajini Khan film. Should be seen as films, as texts constructed by the fans of these guys. These films are meaningless without the meaning making potential of the fans. So the author is not Shah Rukh Khan. The author of Shah Rukh Khan's film is the viewer in a given cultural context. So there is this beautiful canvas of multidisciplinary research which makes research in communication very interesting. What is the point in studying how many centimeters your newspaper gave to a particular politician or a scam? I am not interested in that kind of research. I am interested in research that concerns human beings. Why people eat a particular food? Why people dress in a particular way? Are there similarities between the characters you saw in yesterday's film and the way we dress? Are there differences? What are the material objects inside a room in a 1950 film? What are the material objects in our drawing room today? What have changed? What have remained in the same place? The mirror remains, the bed remains, the chair remains. But they all look different, isn't it? The mirror is no longer having the ornamental frame. The bed is no longer three or four feet above the ground. We use mostly low height cots these days. The chairs no longer look the same. They are rather artificial. What are the differences in terms of colors of the walls? They have changed. So uh, this is a kind of research students like you should engage with. This is more interesting than taking a bunch of newspapers, doing a content analysis, sitting before television, doing a content analysis. You can sit before television and work through visual anthropology. You can sit before television and walk through cultural studies. You can sit before television and walk through historical approach. You can work with the same media through multidisciplinary perspectives. So I expect a lot from your batch in terms of your 
research output so start working on what i have whatever i have said so far and try to pick topics related to these uh, approaches so interesting manageable it will make a original contribution okay thank you